All right, good morning, Rescue House Church. How are we doing this morning? Anybody glad to be in church today? Come on, you can do better than that. It's an amazing time when we get to spend time together in God's house with his presence. Where his presence resides, there is power. And I just believe we're walking into the power and the presence of God today. And we should rejoice every time we get a chance to do that. I think this pandemic, if it's taught us anything, is we should not take the house and worshiping together for granted. Can I get a good amen? Amen. And I just want to take this time just to welcome those that are watching online. There are people watching right now from Texas, from Indiana, from Massachusetts. Shout out to Rescue House North. That's what we call them. We're glad that you're tuning in. All of those from the Winston campus and all over the triad. Can we just as one church together just welcome those in that are watching online and say we're glad that you're taking time to come in and hang out with us. I also just want to get a a shout out to our youth, our Rise Up youth for being on the front row just leading us. Man, love you guys. I also want to give a shout out to those in the overflow. Overflow, make some noise. Hey, just, make, just remember, I can hear you, so I need some good amens out in the overflow today, all right? Hey, we are currently in a series called Stressed Out, and I don't even need to sh- see a show of hands to see who's stressed out or who is coming out of a season of being stressed out or who's currently stressed out or who may be entering into a season of stressed out. At some point this year in 2020, hello, we've been a little bit stressed out. Out And I really wanted to bring a series and a message uh, that I thought would be helpful in this season. And so we've been talking, last week we talked about addiction. I hope you enjoyed my friend Chris Dew, who uh, took over the pulpit last week. If you uh, struggle with addiction, uh, which a lot of us do at certain uh, levels, or you know somebody that does, I want to refer you to that message to go back and watch that or send that message to somebody uh, so that they can begin to watch that as well. And the first week we talked about uh, the number one cause of stress in our lives is money. And so we talked about those six principles of financial peace. I want to encourage you to watch that if you haven't. So you can catch up online. Next week is actually going to be a special week. Uh, My brother, who is a worship leader, uh, he's going to be here and lead worship for us alongside with Jason and the band. And my parents are going to join my brother and his wife and Lauren on stage. Lauren's parents are going to be here as well. It's going to be a special Sunday. I don't want to give that away but um, it's going to be very cool as we have this panel up here for the message time. I think it's going to speak to you. And I'm just excited to have my brother here uh, with me and uh, for you to see him, be led by him. And um, it's pretty cool stuff. So just anytime I get a chance to do that with my family is awesome. And I want you to be here for this. So our theme verse for our Stressed Out series actually comes from Luke 21, 34. And this is where Jesus is talking about the end times. And we're closer than we ever have before, right? I guess you could say that at any time, right? And that would make sense. But we really are. And he, he, he makes this statement at the end. As he walks through, here's what the end times are going to look like. Here's what he lands on to conclude in verse 34. He says, but be careful or your hearts will be weighed down. I wonder if that describes anybody in here or watching online weighed down. See, Jesus is concerned about the inside. We're all worried about the circumstance and the situation and the pandemic and the social rest. But but what Jesus is worried about is, hey, you need to guard your heart. You need to make sure that you're not weighed down with disposition or drunkenness. And that word drunkenness is just really, it means literally drunkenness. And it also figuratively, uh, metaphorically, it means what you medicate your pain with, right? And the anxieties of life. And that day, when you allow your heart to be weighed down with disposition, you medicate your pain with something other than the Holy Spirit, and you have anxieties in your life, and you allow that to creep in, here's what's going to happen. That day will close in on you suddenly like a trap. And that right there describes a lot of people under the sound of my voice today. A lot of people feel trapped. Trapped by their circumstances, trapped by their depression, trapped by their anxiety, trapped by their mental health, trapped by their stress. And today, here's why I'm so pumped up, is because today I'm going to expose the devil's strategy to keep you in a cycle of stress, a cycle of depression, a cycle of anxiety, I'm going to reveal it. Now, anytime we come against the enemy, man, the devil's so mad right now. I I know I can feel it. There's going to be 
more, I pray to hedge of protection over this house, over me, over us, because anytime you come after the devil, he's going to try to come after you. But today, we're going to bring to light his playbook. We're going to bring to light his play, his strategy, and he's been doing it since the beginning of time. And I'm going to teach it to you so that you can learn how to combat it. This past summer, we went on vacation, speaking of my brother, and we spent a week together at Dirty Myrtle. Hello, right? And he brought this little, he brought a pastime this, this, this week to the beach. He, he bought, a, a, it was like a new Nintendo system, but it's a retro, you know what I'm saying? It's like a little one, but it's like loaded with like 50 games on it. And we come in, I'm like, man, forget the beach. I just wanna play like Super Tech Mobo. Like that's what I'm all about. I don't know how many of you grew up on like Nintendo. Anybody, raise a hand, right? Anybody wanna admit in here that you grew up on Atari? Anybody? You showing your age right now, okay, all right. But we'll just call it wisdom, all right. Um, but I grew up on Nintendo, and our favorite game was Super Tech Mobile, and so it was loaded on this. And so we just started playing this. We were like, forget the beach, right? Like, so we're just playing this. If you've ever played Super Tech Mobile, it's like one of the first football games uh, ever to come out on a video game system, and you only got four plays to choose from. And it was just like we went back to our childhood. He got, you know, he picked his team just like we were, you know, four and eight again. He picked San Francisco with Joe Montana and Jerry Rice. And I picked uh, New York Giants for Lawrence Taylor. Hello, somebody. Come on, got to pick my Tar Heels, all right? Uh, by the way, he's considered Lawrence Taylor. He's considered the GOAT in football. So we got the GOAT in football and we got the GOAT in basketball. Hello. Props up to God's team. Okay, all right. All um, right. I just had to throw that in there. So we got to, so he gets four, we get four offensive plays that we get to pick. In the defense, we have to choose which play that he's going to pick. And if we pick out of the four plays, if I'm on defense and he's on offense, he picks a play. And if I pick his play, the play that he picks, he has no chance of moving the ball forward. In fact, he's going to go backwards because the defense is going to collapse and crush the offense. Well, guess what? I knew what my brother's favorite play was from all the way back from 1992 when we would play. I knew, I knew what his go-to play was, and so I just kept picking that play. I just kept, and he would get so mad because he couldn't, every time he picked that play, I knew his go-to play, and, and the defense would just crush him, and he couldn't move the football down the field. And of course I won because I always win in sports with my brother. He can sing, but I can play sports, all right? And I can preach, uh, but he can sing. That's about all he can do. Okay, I'm sorry if you're watching this or listening to this, Brad. He's gonna be here next week, oh my goodness. Okay. And I would just pick his play over and over again. Now, what would it do if I could share with you what the enemy's go-to play was every time? How would that change the game for you as you would learn to recognize it and you could learn to combat it? I'm telling you, you wouldn't just play defense. You would be able to crush the enemy and his tactics and his plays. And that's what I want to do to you today. I want to preach a message to you I'm calling the devil's playbook. The devil's playbook. I'm just going to give you the play of the devil. I'm going to let you know how he works, how he is working in this pandemic, in the social unrest. Because, man, he's having a heyday right now. He really is. But he doesn't have to, he doesn't have the power to have the heyday. We have the power. Come on, somebody. We got Jesus. And if we know his play, man, we can combat that and we can crush the enemy. The devil has two goals. Write this down. I don't have it on the screen, but write it down. He wants you to disconnect you from God, and then he wants to disconnect you from one another. And come on, Rescue House, he's succeeding in this season. He wants to disconnect us relationally from our Heavenly Father and then disconnect us relationally from one another. It's one of the reasons why we're launching small groups today and why every single person watching online, in the overflow, in this auditorium should find your way into a small group of other believers who can cheer you on and who love you and who can see some blind spots for you and kind of help you in your journey with Jesus. But that's the enemy, man, that's what he wants to do. That's his, that's his goal is to disconnect us from God and disconnect us from one another. And I'm going to show you this from the very first account in the Bible where the, Satan runs this play. It's found in Genesis chapter 3 in the story of Adam and Eve. Now, if you're not familiar with the story of Adam and Eve, God created in the beginning two human beings. Their names were Adam and Eve. He created a garden, the Garden of Eden, 
And he placed these two human beings in there and he said, you're gonna have dominion over this garden and over the earth. You really, you just need to abide by one rule. You can eat from anything in here. You can touch anything in here, but I don't want you to eat from the tree of knowledge and truth and good and evil, all right? You're not to touch that. Don't even touch it. Not only are you just not supposed to eat from it, but don't touch it. And that's kind of where we pick up this story. Now, I want you to see how the enemy comes along, takes that command from God and begins to twist it and thwart it. And he deceives them. This is Genesis 3, 1 through 7. It says, Now the serpent, which is the enemy, was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, this is the first, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it, or you will die. You will, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then in that moment, their eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And I'm just gonna give you a little sneak peek as we move along in this message. Anytime you decide to be disobedient to God and you do it your way and you don't do it God's way, shame will always come on you and you will always feel a need to run and hide. And that's what they did. So let me, out of this scripture, out of this passage, I'm gonna give you the devil's number one play. And it's called this right here, write this down. It's called the cycle of deception. The cycle of deception. The cycle consists of five things that the enemy does to disconnect us from God and from one another and isolate ourselves so that we can live in a bubble of depression and stress and anxiety and we're cut off from God and we're cut off from one another. And if he can keep us in that space and in that place, he has won the spiritual war on our minds. So five things. And I also want you to know, God is a relational God. He wants to be known by you and he wants to know you. He wants to be intimate with you. And most of our stress comes when we're disobedient to God and when we're disconnected from God and disconnected from one another. Let's talk about the first step in the cycle. If you're ready, shout, I'm ready. Ready. Come on, Overflow, say, if you're ready, say, I'm ready. I didn't hear him. Okay, all right, I trust you. I trust you got it. Here we go, number one thing in the cycle of deception is this right here, the enemy will always get you, this is how he starts out with you, he will always get you to question God's word. Every time. It's how he started with Eve, it's how he starts with you, is he'll come and he's so deceptive, he'll say, man, did did God really say that? Did did God really say that in his word? Like, did God really say that I've got to forgive those who hurt me? Did God say that I like, did God really say? Did God say I gotta love my enemies? That I can't just love those who love me, but I have to treat others as I would wanna be treated? See, but you think that that offense doesn't apply to you and that you can hold onto that offense and man, I wanna hold onto that bitterness because I feel like I'm punishing them. Did God really say that? Did God really say that, like, if I think about someone sexually, emotionally, in my mind and in my heart, it's like the same as, like, doing it? Did did God really say that? Nah. And he just, the enemy, man, he'll just poke you and then leave you alone a little bit and then just kind of poke you a little bit. Did God really say 
Listen, the enemy knows what God says. He knows scripture than better, better than some of you in the room. And we have to recognize that. He knows what God's word says. But he'll come along and poke you and say, did, did God really say that? And I want you to know the devil's here for the long game. He'll poke you, leave you alone, poke you, leave you alone. And he will wait decades to destroy you. He is so patient with this. And he always starts out. This is how he started out with Eve, right? Did God really say that you can't eat of that fruit? Eat of that tree? Ah, oh, no, nah, he didn't. You know, maybe he was just, maybe I just misunderstood something there. Did, did God really say I can't like test drive the goods before I get married? Did God really say that? He didn't say it like that, but Pastor Matt paraphrased, trying to, we got children in the room trying to. Oh, maybe he didn't, you know, and it's, it's okay. Culture says that it's okay. My boss says it's okay. And we begin to adjust God's word to fit our life. It's the number one play of the enemy. Can I just stop right here and just say that God's word is here to protect us, not prohibit us. Come on, God didn't put in his word in here so that you could like, just to take away your fun card or to, to take away a life that you think is gonna like make you happy if you did things your way. That's not what this is for. I equate it to children playing on a cliff, right? It's very unloving to just let children play on a cliff with no boundaries, but it's loving to put up a fence so that they don't fall off of that cliff. And that's what the word of God is. There is boundaries in here. There are some things in here that confront us that kind of get us going, you know, and maybe we just don't like. But this is for our good, and it is for God's glory. And culture will always say, you can adjust God's word to fit your life. In other words, you, you, you know, we want to follow all the scriptures that apply to us, that's easy for us to apply, but man, when it, did God really say that I got a tithe? To my local storehouse, this is the storehouse of, do I really, no, nah, I'm not, I'm not going to do that, but I believe all this other stuff that God said. Did God really say that if I don't tithe that my finances are going to be under a curse? Did he say that? Nah. And he just continues just to poke you and poke you. Did God's word really say that if I don't forgive someone, that he won't forgive me? You better believe it. One of the most dangerous things you could ever say is, I'll never forgive them for that. Because you're sentencing yourself. Because God's word says, if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. That's a word for somebody here, maybe watching online today. And so we don't adjust God's word to fit our life. That's very dangerous. In other words, we, what we want to do is fit our life into God's word. We want to adjust our life to fit God's word, to raise to his standard. Well, I don't like some of the stuff in the Bible. Well, neither do I, because it confronts my greed when I read it. Well, it kind of stings me a little bit. Well, it should at times. I mean, there are sometimes I read this Bible and I'm like, have it open and I'm leaning, I'm like, dang. Like, can I, can I read the map section today? Like, I just want to, like, see the Mediterranean Sea, <laughs> you know? Like, because it just, like, confronts me, and it's hard. The Bible is like a mirror, so you look at yourself, and sometimes it shows you imperfections that you need to go fix. It's alive. It's active. Did God say I really have to love the person that bashed me? talks junk about my church? Do I really have to love them? 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 says, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is. I love this. The word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. So if you ever thought, well, I don't really believe that because it don't work for me. Well, Exactly. Because if you don't believe it, it doesn't work. It's only working in the ones who believe it. 
I'll say it like this. If you work the word, it'll work. You just got to work the word. Number two, the enemy will always want to downplay the consequences. So the first thing he's going to get you to do is question God's word. Did God really say that? And then he's going to downplay the consequences and be like, it's not really that bad. That's what he said to Eve. He said, surely you won't die. Surely you're not going to die. And he downplays the consequences. And you think carrying this bitterness around, man, that's not really going to grow through me like cancer. And it's not really going to be that bad. And I'm punishing the other person if I don't forgive them. If I watch this little thing on the internet or I watch this show, man, it's not that big of a deal. I'm not going to let it seep into my heart. And when you allow the enemy to downplay the consequences, you can justify about anything. We're great. We're a great society of people who love to justify just about anything. You know how I know? How many donuts have you justified on a diet before? You're like, man, I walked up and down the stairs today four times. I need a donut, all right? And you're thinking, man, I walked out to the mail today, the mailbox, I got the mail, and I walked back, and I, I had to burn at least 1,000 calories. I deserve a donut. When really you burn five calories, and the donut's 500 calories, okay? And that's, that's what the, and I'm speaking to somebody today, right? That's how the devil works with us. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, there is a way that appears to be right, that's what the enemy will do, but in the end, it leads to death. You gotta ask for wisdom to rise above what may seem to be right, but actually leads to death because we can justify anything and the enemy is at work downplaying the consequences of your sin and of our actions and of our mistakes. Just saying it's not that big of a deal. Step number three, the enemy will attack God's intentions. So he'll come along and say, did you really, did God really say that? Oh, it's not going to be that big a, big a deal. He looked at Eve and he says, you know what? If you, the reason that like, God doesn't want you to eat the fruit is because when you eat of it, you're going to know good and evil. You're going to be like God. And he doesn't want you to be like that. You see how the enemy thwarts that? The enemy will say, man, we don't, he doesn't want you to be on the same level as him. And so he's attacking God's intention. When God's intentions really are to protect the enemy will say it's his intention to prohibit. He will tell you God doesn't really have good things in store for you, in mind for you. His intentions aren't good. And then we start saying things like, well, I guess God doesn't want me to be happy. I guess God doesn't want me to, you know, live a life of joy or do this or that. I guess God just wants me to suffer through this life. And the enemy will sell you that bill of goods and it is false. It's false. I don't know what kind of church you grew up in, but I grew up in a church that, this was one of the hymns that we sang. It, it, you might, some of you might remember this, but it was in a hymn, a hymn book, and it was called The All-Seeing Eye is Watching You. That's pretty encouraging, isn't it? Like, right? Like we come in and like we open up to them, we sing this and there's an all-seeing eye watching you. And all I'd get is this picture of this like God, this father who has like one eye open at all time. And the Bible says he never sleeps because he's just watching you and just waiting for you to sin and to pounce on you and trying to jump on you and, and catch you in your sin. That's the kind of God that we serve. And so, you know what the youth group taught me? The youth group taught me, don't do this, don't do that. Don't drink, don't smoke, and don't chew. And don't date girls that do, all right? That was my youth group message, all right? <laughs> I mean, that's what, like, don't do this because there's an all-seeing eye watching you, ready to pounce on you, and that's our Heavenly Father, and we gotta be straight-laced, and there's no grace. Another message they taught was don't have sex because it's bad, it's horrible, it's ugly. Save it for the one you love and you marry. What a terrible message. It's, it's ugly, it's bad, it's horrible. Save it for your wife, all right? <laughs> it's stupid. I mean, like, and it was because they had this idea and misconception of God's intentions. God is not an all-seeing God waiting to catch you in your sin, 
Psalm 1611 says this, you will show me the path of life. Come on, this is our God. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is the God that we serve, pleasures forevermore. This is the intentions of the God that we serve. Number four, after he attacks God's intentions, he's gonna get you to exalt yourself. This is what he did with Eve. Come on, Eve, think about yourself. Don't you wanna be exalted to the level of God? Don't you wanna know all that God knows? Come on, think about yourself. To which we come in our society, in our time, we say it like this, man, I just gotta do what makes, make me, makes me feel good. Wow. I'd be in jail if I did everything that like, makes me feel good. I mean, don't leave me hanging either, you holier than thou people. Thank you. Like, okay, all right, appreciate it, appreciate it. I got one like me. All right. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says this, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And so if you have surrendered to Christ Jesus, you are not your own. You are not calling the shots. The enemy wants you to, to, to start calling the shots and think you're equal with God. And man, if I was just in charge, if I, if I could just do things my way, I would do it this way. I'd do what makes me feel good. And that leads you to death and destruction. At some point in the day, I try to do this every day. As I try to have a moment, and most of the time it's in the morning, but sometimes it's later in the day if I forget. But at some point during the day, I try to look to God and I say, God, today, I'm fully submitted to you. I am not my own. I am yours. And I yield myself to you, my spirit to you, my body to you, my soul to you. Have your way with me today. And I say that not because God needs to hear that. I say it because Matt needs to hear that. And I need to make sure I'm walking into the day Understanding that Jesus Christ purchased me with his blood shed on the cross and he paid a high price for me and what he has for me is good and he knows me better than I know myself and I fully trust him and I'm surrendered to him. How would that change the game for you if every day you submitted to Jesus, the Father and the Holy Spirit? And then the last part is he uses shame to trap you and this is the closer this is the, probably the most powerful thing. He'll say, man, did God really say that? Get you to question what God told you in his word, what he's spoken to your life. He'll downplay the consequences, attack God's intentions, puff you up, let you know that you're somebody. And then boom, you, create a, you, you, you make a mistake. You walk into sin and then boom, immediately, you know what he does? You're an idiot. Who do you think you are? Man, your father, he's really mad at you right now. I can't believe you did that. What were you thinking? And all of a sudden, in that moment, shame begins to cover us. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. What did it say? It said their eyes were opened. What was it open to? It was open to evil. They realized that they were naked. And so what did they do? They ran, they hid, and they covered themselves. And that's what the enemy wants to do to you. Is he wants to puff you up, get you going, question God's word, attack God's intentions, and then boom, as soon as you make the mistake, you're an idiot. You're a spoiled child. Your father doesn't want anything to do with you right now. In fact, you're gonna have to wait days to even approach him. Maybe you might wanna think about going and doing some good stuff to try to get back in his good graces. But for a while, you need to just not even talk to your father because he's so mad at you right now. Oh man, this is what the enemy does. And then you know what he does? He starts all over again. 
Did the Bible really say there's no condemnation? Nah, there's condemnation for you. And he starts back all over again. Over again. And we get caught up in the cycle of deception. And we become isolated, disconnected from God, disconnected from one another. I know the world has their solutions to mental health and things of that nature. But we as believers, we are fighting a spiritual warfare. We are fighting in a realm that cannot be seen. And I'm telling you today, prophetically, and I don't normally say that very often, but this is where our mental health problems are coming from. We are not fighting a war against flesh and blood. We are fighting an enemy who's fighting in a realm and he doesn't play by the rules and he keeps us in a cycle of depression and deception and he just keeps hammering us and he, man, he's playing the long game with you, your family. The Bible says that he's a lion prowling around, seeking to destroy whomever he may devour. And this is how he rules. But man, I love what Romans 8, 1 and 2 says. Come on, this is somebody's verse. So now there is no condemnation for those who believe in Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Come on, that's where you're seated in. You're seated in the power and the presence of God and the grace of God. And therefore, when you make a mistake, when you mess up, you don't have to run from God. You run to God. You run to his presence and to his power. And listen to me. That's not even the best news. The best news is he's not an all-seeing God waiting to trap you and kill you and crush you. He wants you to run to him so he can forgive you, so he can restore you, so that he can clean you up, so that he can pick you back up and help you on a journey. But the problem is, have you ever had this moment where you made a mistake, you sinned, you knew it, and you felt, man, I can't pray to God today. That's the enemy every time. I can't approach God, I can't. That's gonna have to wait a couple days. That's That's the enemy. You should run to God. Because he's waiting, he's a loving father with his arms open wide. Think about the prodigal son arms open wide. This is a depiction of the Father. Ready for you to come home. But some of you, man, your life, if if you're being honest, it's like you're on a merry-go-round right now. You're like, how am I going to get off of this? Let me help you real quick. I'm already over time, but I don't even care today. So what do we do? Here are the four things I'm going to give you real quick. Number one, we're going to submit to God's word. Submit to God's word. In other words, I'm not going to adjust God's word to my life. I'm going to adjust my life to God's word. And if he said it, come on somebody, I believe it. And I'm taking it to the bank and I'm going to do my best to be obedient to it. Where it confronts me, I'm going to wrestle with it. But I believe in God's word, I'm submitted to the word of God. Number two, we're gonna surround ourselves, surround yourself with godly people. If you're not in a small group, get in a small group. You need people that are gonna come beside of you. You need community that's gonna encourage you. It's so important. Speak life over you. People who care about your purpose and your destiny and we need one another. This is a chance for you to join a small group, get your head up, get your shoulders back, and begin to walk with confidence again. Number three, I want to encourage you to seek wisdom. Come on, this is how you get out of the cycle of deception. This is how you combat the enemy. Seek wisdom. You know what the Bible says? Though it may cost you everything, go get you some wisdom. Pray for wisdom, and God will give it to you. I suggest that you won't find wisdom on your Facebook feed. Can I get an amen? 
You're not going to find it on TikTok. That one's for y'all. Just to let you know I'm thinking about you. We're about to lose TikTok to China anyway, so don't worry about it. You find this in prayer, wisdom and community, in church, in church. Come on, I want to encourage some of y'all watching online to get back to the house. Come on, in church, there's something about being amongst the believers, reading God's word. And then the last thing I want to encourage you to do, and this is big, is to stay seated in God's grace. Stay seated in God's grace. When you blow it, don't run from God. Don't run out of grace. Don't let the enemy talk you out of that. You run to God. And don't let him think, get you thinking that you've got to perform your way back to God or you've got to do some things or take a few days to just like get back right with God yourself. You just stay seated in grace. Some days you're winning, and some days you're learning. Listen to me. If you'll stay seated in grace, you're never losing. Some days we're winning. Some days we're learning. But if you'll learn to stay seated in grace, you're never losing. So make sure you stay submitted to God's word. You're staying in community. You're seeking wisdom stand seated in grace pray with me all of our locations all the people watching online there are some of you here today when I'm talking about grace you don't even really know what I'm talking about when I say you don't have to earn your way to God you don't have to work your way to God that seems kind of foreign to you but that is the gospel that the gospel is the free gift of God through Jesus Christ he sent his one and only son to die for you And his blood that was shed for you on a cross covers your sins if you will place your faith in him. And if you're here today or you're watching online and you are far from God and you don't want to be, you don't have to be anymore. You are literally one sincere prayer away. And it's not the prayer that saves you. It's your faith behind the prayer that saves you. And I'm going to lead us in a prayer in just a moment for those who would say, man, I need to place my faith in Jesus. I need this grace that you're talking about. And if you want to come to Jesus and have a vibrant, life-giving relationship with our Father, and your sin would be forgiven, past, present, and future, wiped clean, and you pray this prayer with me right now, online, in the room. Do not bow out of this moment. You pray it silently in your heart. If it expresses the sincere desire of your heart, you will be saved. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for you and was raised again on the third day, you will be saved. That's not my words. That's the Bible's words. That's what God said. So if that's you today, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I need you. I need you in my life. I repent of my sin. I repent of my way. And I want to do it your way. I believe you died for me and I believe you rose again on the third day and I want you to be my Lord and my King and I promise from this day forward to live for you all the days of my life the best way I know how. With every head bowed, with every eye closed, if you just pray that prayer, based on the Holy Scriptures, based on what God said, you are saved and you have a home in heaven. It's amazing. You went from death to life and you began a new journey with Jesus today. And I'm just gonna ask you, if you prayed that prayer today, I'm gonna ask you to take it one step further. Nobody's looking around. I'm not gonna embarrass you. I wouldn't embarrass you for the world. But when I say three, I want you to shoot your hand in the air. If you're online, I want you to click the button that says I raised my hand today. You be obedient to this. Don't bow out of this. You have the courage of Christ. To say, today, I follow Jesus, or today, I came back to God. Here we go. One, two, three. Come on, lift your hand high in the air. It's amazing. It's awesome. Awesome. If you're online, lift your hands. I pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for those that are giving their lives to Jesus right now. God, I pray that you would protect them. 
God, that you would give them wisdom beyond their years. God, we welcome them to the family of God as they start their journey with you. God, I pray that they would find a small group, they would find a place in this house and in your church. God, we just lift them up in the palm of your hands and we pray that we would help them in their journey with you. Thank you. We welcome them to the family of God. We thank you for salvation falling on this house. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Come on, can we just celebrate those that are giving their lives to Jesus? Come on, let's go. Let's go. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in with us today. I hope that this message has blessed you and your family. And if this ministry is a blessing to you, I would invite you to partner with us financially by giving through the Rescue House app or online at our website. I'd also encourage you to share this message with your friends and your family members or on social media so that it can be a blessing to others as well. And lastly, I would love to invite you to be a part of what God is doing here by coming to an in-person gathering here at our Moxville campus. We love you guys. We hope you have a great week and we will see you back next Sunday.